Hare Krishna. <clears throat> so again, it's another late um, Facebook Live tonight. I had to go out and do a few things today, but I'm sticking to my commitment of doing these every day. So today's topic, um, if you would have seen in the heading at the top of this post, there was a quote which was recently made by someone on um, Facebook, which I think is worth discussing. It's an interesting comment. Um, the comment was as follows. The ability to level what I consider to be healthy criticism of ISKCON is what I see as a gift from Krishna. If I ruffle some feathers, I think I also inspire some. Hmm. So there's a lot of interesting points to, um, to bring out from this quote. And, um, you know, definitely worth considering and discussing. So, the first point that I would like to make is the trouble with ISKCON. It's a kind of a play on words that I've written in the heading. When I say the trouble with ISKCON is that if we talk about ISKCON, who are we really talking about? Um, ISKCON is an organization that has many different members with many different philosophies, different practices, um, and different ways of doing things. So I think it's, it's very hard to say um, ISKCON is like this. Because generally what we really mean to say is there are a group of people within ISKCON who are doing this and, and I don't like that. Or we could go as far as to say um, there is a tendency for the majority of devotees in ISKCON you know, to be like this, but again, it's a generalization. And so I think that we have to be very careful about generalizing and grouping people together. Um, the, the context of this quote was talking about how there are other organizations who are doing kirtan and uh, apparently being very successful, you know, reaching the masses and making kirtan popular. And so the author of this quote, um, you know, who I have a lot of respect for, although I don't always agree with everything, um, is he was making the point that um, ISKCON doesn't seem to have taken advantage of this, you know, kirtan movement as much as these other groups um, seem to have done. Um, and then, you know, he, he had his understanding of why that might be as well. Um, so I think it's interesting, and it's, I think, um, so first of all, rather than, you know, talking about ISKCON, it's better to talk about um, more specific examples. Say that, um, you know, when devotees behave in a particular way, we can make a commentary about that. Um, rather than lumping everyone in ISKCON into that category. You know, for example, in this particular um, post, it was saying that I think that the problem is that, you know, we're too stuck in our traditional ways and we need to be more modern and um, in tune with what people like. So in saying that, it's implying that everyone in ISKCON is, um, is out of touch, you know, with what people like. However, there are certainly devotees that are taking initiative in this area and having some success. And at the same time, there's also some devotees who are sticking with the traditional understanding or the traditional uh, approach and also having um, success. You know, like in the example of Kirtan, um, somebody mentioned about Vyasaki, that he's got a very traditional style of Kirtan and it's appreciated by people. Um, you know, and then on the other hand, you have, um, you know, devotees like uh, Pierre Adel, um, Prema Prabhu, who, you know, they're doing like heavy metal music, but they're exposing Krishna to people in a way which is, you know, very modern. And that's also good exposure for Krishna consciousness, you know, in a more modern and a different kind of a way. So I think... Um, you know, there can be a tendency to think that, oh, there's only one right way to do things. And to think of an organization like ISKCON as kind of like uniform um, or homogenous. 
Whereas actually within ISKCON there's so many different individuals, so many different approaches, um, and that's part of spiritual life. Um, part of spiritual life is individuality, and um, there may be differences of opinion, but that variety is something that makes everything exciting. You know, the principle of Yukta Vairagya is using everything in Krishna's service. And so that includes, you know, um, traditional um, approaches and more modern approaches. And we don't need to um, kind of label one or the other or minimize one or the other. We need to look at, you know, what, what might be more appropriate in a particular situation, according to our opinion. And then from that point, um, you know, take some action to rectify things. So if we see something which we think is not, you know, as we think it should be, let's show an example how we can do it better. And with that in mind, um, I was looking at this book because it reminded me of, um, of previously I've read this book, My Glorious Master, by His Grace Guru John Prabhu. And there's a really interesting example in here where Guru John Prabhu had become a follower of Siddha Swarup. So there's a history in ISKCON, um, when was it, 1976, this conversation was taking place, where um, Siddha Swarup and his followers, um, including Twista Krishna, they felt that people didn't like um, devotees, that they felt that people would consider devotees weird because of the dress that they wore, you know, like the traditional Indian clothes and the Indian instruments. Um, and so that was one, uh, one aspect that they didn't like. So therefore they um, were wearing Western clothes and, um, you know, using guitars rather than, you know, cartels so that it would relate more to the people. You know, that was part of their approach. And the other aspect of... Um, Siddha Swarup's um, movement at, of the time was that they were not really in favor of book distribution. So the basic explanation is that their justification was that many devotees were distributing books using dishonest methods and it was causing a bad reputation for the movement. Um, in the same way that they were saying that, you know, devotees who are dressing in um, you know, Indian clothes, like dhotis, for example, looked really weird, and it was, you know, people, it was turning people away from Krishna, is what they were saying. So, what, <coughs> Burijan Prabhu was um, part of this movement, and he um, accepted a lot of these ideas, and he was explaining to Srila Prabhupada his thoughts. So I'll just summarize it, and maybe read a few extracts. Um, so, I'll just have a quick look here. So this is particularly about... Oh, so Prabhupada's asking, you know, why are you attracted to Siddha Swarup's um, group and, and Siddha Swarup in particular? What's so special about him? So he was saying that I, I like the emphasis on humility and on chanting. Um, and then Prabhupada said, well, what do you mean humility? I've given the instruction to distribute books, but you don't want to distribute books. So where's the humility if you're not following the order of the spiritual master? Um, so this is basically what he's saying. Um, and he's saying, oh, you know, that they encourage to chant more. So Prabhupada said, well, you know, where's the objection? If you want to chant more, did anyone complain? And of course no one did complain. Um, so, yeah, the point was, he was saying here that, where was saying, when I was in Hong Kong, people would meet, uh, people I would meet, they used to yell, they'd yell at me. What have you done to Krishna? Some Indians used to say that people that we'd meet, they'd tell us they see the Hare Krishna devotees and they hate Krishna. I remember one specific time when I was speaking to one businessman who was helping us and Prabhupada, he said that we hate Krishna? Brujan. No, no, he said, your members of the Hare Krishna, they're making people in Australia hate Krishna. They make people inimical, making people inimical to Krishna. Um... And then Pushta Krishna Prabhu was, uh, Maharaj was there and he was trying to um, 
so that you know because we are strongly doing book distribution. And Barujan said, and also because Prabhupada interrupted him, because we are selling books. And Barujan said, no, not so much the selling books. Maybe the emphasis on how much money can be taken. Like if someone says on the street, please give me a donation. So they give a donation. No, you give more, and more and more. So the people think that devotees are only interested in getting money, and they get a bad impression that ISKCON is a money-making movement. And then push the Krishna said, we're selling one half million large-sized books every year. And Prabhupada said, that is envious. So if they sell books, so that is making Krishna unpopular? So he's making the point that um, that the um, Siddhas group there criticizing the book distribution um, but look how many books are being distributed and how, and you know we, we know how distributing Srila Prabhupada's books can change people's lives so much um, and then so Prabhupada was you know agreeing with push the Krishna's point uh, Maharaj's point that um, the books are being distributed. It's not just that they're collecting money, they're distributing books which are naturally benefiting people. So then it continues, Burijan. But one must learn to be a good book salesman, I think. Prabhupada. But selling book about Krishna doesn't mean that the booksellers are creating unpopular opinion. Does it mean? Burijan. Automatically no. So Prabhupada. When you say that they are making enemies because they are pushing this, what is wrong there? Actually, so far I understand you do not like to sell books, or you cannot sell books. Burijan, I never really tried that much. So Prabhupada, those who are selling books, you think of them that they're not very advanced. Burijan, I don't think they can continue for very long if they're not advanced. Prabhupada, but actually they are doing, so why you say they cannot continue long? And then anyway, he explains more about some of the techniques that devotees were doing, which were not so good at book distribution, and then... I'll just jump down a little bit further um, because it goes on for pages. <laughs> and, he, and Prabhupada talks about, you know, you're, you're um, trying to be a moralist but you're missing the, the transcendental point of service to Krishna in order of the spiritual master. So then, again Prabhupada emphasizes, um, Prabhupada says, I, I don't know, don't know what um, they are doing. Um, Sorry, I'll just move on a bit more. Yeah, so the final conclusion, Prabhupada is saying that, look, I'm the, if the spiritual master is saying to do book selling, that's what you should try to do. And um, I'll just yeah, quickly go ahead. So basically he's saying, look, I want book distribution to happen, and now it may not be done perfectly, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll skip to the end here. Um, so Hari Shari said, Prabhupada's point is that if you see fault with the method of implementing the spiritual master's instructions, uh, you'll fail, to, he says something, then Prabhupada says no. The point is not that they have not done any wrong, don't think like that, but my main point is that my instruction is to sell books. And then so Burijan concludes here, I understand. In other words, if you think they're doing it wrong, you do it better. If you see others are doing it wrong, make sure you do it, but do it without the wrong thing. Don't stop doing it. Prabhupada, yes. Besides that, if you do not take to deity worship, you should remain unclean. That's a fact. So extra comment um, by Prabhupada there. Um, so, yeah, so the, really, the point that I like here is that when... Um, Rujan Prabhu is talking about these criticisms, Prabhupada is saying that, okay, it's fair enough, you know, um, this is where the constructive criticism comes in. That, yeah, sure, if you notice something that's not um, being done correctly, then you do it and do it in a better way, in the correct way, and try to um, correct that. But don't stop the activity because some people are not doing it right. So I thought this was an interesting point, and, you know, because it's very easy to... Um, point out faults, you know, once again, this idea of um, the fly and the bee, you know, the bee is looking for, you know, what's the good thing, whereas the fly is looking for the fault. And so that was one thing that concerned me about this this quote that I've put at this heading here, that we need to um, be con a little bit more careful about, is 
what I consider to be healthy criticism. So we need to be very careful. What is healthy criticism and what is fault finding? And um, so there's a few aspects to it. <clears throat> I discussed it briefly last night. One of the points is that it should be pleasing, should be truthful, and it should be beneficial. So um, when we are presenting something, we first of all have to think, you know, what's our motive? when we're um, presenting things. And then the next thing that we need to um, look at is, am I presenting it in a way which is you know, pleasing and beneficial? Um, we don't just want to say things that make people feel good if it's not going to be um, you know, beneficial. Um, and this goes both ways. Sometimes we might say something um, critical because we know that there's certain people that, that like that kind of thing. Um, so it's an inverse almost. But really, I think the key points are, in particular, that it's truthful and that um, it's beneficial. So first of all, our intention is to you know, make things better. And then second of all, we have to think, am I presenting it in such a way that will um, generate the beneficial effect? And the point that Prabhupada's making here, too, is the, the basic idea. If you see something you don't like, you know, do something to make it better. You show by the example how it can be done in a better way. Um, so yeah, I was a little concerned about this. Um, the ability to criticize is a gift from Krishna. I'm not sure if I'm not too sure about that, but it could be. But you have to be very careful because it's it's easy to get into the um, the mood of fault finding. And I think we need to be careful about being focused on um, improving. Because if we, um, like as it says here, if I ruffle some feathers, I think I also inspire some. So now the interesting thing here is that um, it's very true that when you make a stand for something, there'll be some people that um, don't like it and some people who do like it. And this is called polarization, and it's a, a method of... Um, um, marketing, marketing approach that if you try to please everybody, you please nobody. But if you really um, focus on pleasing one group of people, even at the expense of others, um, then those people will like you more. In other words, if you stand against um, the enemy, so to speak, then your allies will support you even more. And, you know, we can see in this con, this. Um, happens as well where devotees try to, you know, they form these camps that are, oh, um, we've got this approach and we're right and the other guys, they're not right. And this kind of party spirit is the thing that concerns me. Rather than, um, you know, having a broad-minded viewpoint on things and being open to uh, different ideas and different viewpoints, if we take a party political position that I stand for this, you know, I am a Republican, a Democrat, East or West, um, you know, whatever there's you know, different designations, then it's another designation. Um, rather than looking at the, the ultimate principle that we can use to serve Krishna by and, um, you know, to do what's best for Krishna's movement and to inspire devotees rather than um, to cause uh, tension. Now, sometimes it may be needed if there's something serious to cool things up, you know, like the example would be, you know, child abuse or um, um, a case of misuse of power and funds and things like that. That it may be necessary to call it out. If something's going wrong and nobody's doing anything about it, we need to call it out for sure. Um, but in other cases, I think when our devotees are sincerely doing the best that they can. I don't think that's the time to um, be criticizing. Um, and another way to think about criticism is instead of pointing out that, oh, look at this kind, we're so out of it, these other people are doing so much better than us, another way to look at it would be, well, wow, look what these guys are doing. They're getting somewhere. Here's an opportunity. How can we take advantage of it? So it's exactly the same point, but just the way that it's spoken. Um, is has a different uh, different feel to it, a different flavor, much more inspiring from my point of view. 
um, when you speak in that kind of way. When you look at it from the point of view of opportunity, rather than, oh, we, you know, look at what we're doing wrong. Instead, it's like, hey, look what these guys are doing. This is something that we could be doing, right? It's a totally different energy, and I think a much more constructive energy. And that's where this idea of constructive criticism, I think, is a very important one. When we talk about healthy criticism, I think that, that we need to be looking at, you know, is this constructive? Is it leading to um, a better outcome you know, for, um, you know, for the preaching movement? So let's just have a look again. Was there any other points that I wanted to bring here? Um, yeah, so I think this idea of opportunities is a, a little bit like the idea of, the, the, again, the bee and the fly. Um, we may notice something that's not going so well, but as a bee, we're trying to see where's the nectar that we can take and get strength from, rather than um, you know sticking on the dirty things, which is not really constructive. Um, so let me share a few examples that have come up recently, which you know challenged me to think about this. A very general idea is, um, you know, just as this uh, devotee was talking about. Um, you know, these Kirtan festivals have become popular. Uh, and perhaps as a society or in general, not many devotees have taken advantage of it. So in the same way, I would think about uh, internet preaching, that there's been some some good initiatives from devotees like ISKCON Desire Tree. Um, you know, they're, they're so prolific in their content production and in their... Um, their um, initiatives to get um, Krishna consciousness out to the world. And I think it's really effective, particularly in India. Um, but my observation of the material that they're producing, it's not so uh, attractive or on the wavelength of the Western audience. So I think there's an opportunity there uh, in the West to do a lot more in the internet. So again, I'm, I'm presenting it as an opportunity. You know, I could say, oh, just see, you know, these other religions are preaching on the internet and they're doing so many things and we we could have done it but we didn't you know it, it can be very negative and um, down but is that inspiring someone to take action I don't think so I mean in the past I used to have this um, this way of preaching so to speak I would give Bhagavatam class and say oh, I went to McDonald's when you know I was out on book distribution and I went and used the toilet and it was so clean but when I come back to the temple, it's so dirty. Even McDonald's has got cleaner toilets than us. You know, this um, mood of um, pointing out the faults and criticizing, I find is not effective. I, I've, I've tried it and um, didn't find it to be particularly useful. So, okay, coming back up to the present. Um, yesterday, I, I had this experience as well where I was noticing you know, some areas that I thought could improve, specifically about serving prasadam at our local temple at festivals because nowadays there's many families with young children and um, the programs are often very late and prasadam is not served until late and then you know you get home late it's really difficult for the children you know and it's also difficult for um, you know parents um, I mean for myself I like to get up early to chant my rounds and I find it hard with these late festivals so a couple of devotees made a few suggestions and I, you know, um, added my input <laughs> about how I think that, you know, at a festival, um, as soon as the prasadam's ready, they should start serving. They shouldn't wait to think, oh, no, only until the program's over, then we'll feed people, they have to stay in the temple room. Um, this, is, this is my thinking. And, um, and I've seen that when they do start serving, that there's plenty of devotees in the temple still that are continuing the program. And the devotees that um, are served, you know, they, they are able to feed their children. Or if they're just hungry people, you know, they get to eat and feel satisfied. Um, and then often they'll go back to the temple and join the program again. And I think that it's, um, you know, it's an effective um, strategy. But then I was also thinking to myself that, you know, I'm writing this through, um, you know, a Facebook comment. And I'm wondering, you know, how it will be taken, that perhaps it's not the best um, avenue for sharing my ideas of you know how things can improve because it's natural that devotees that are, are running the temple that have set up the program the way it is um, 
you know, they might not like it if I'm saying, oh, I don't think the way you're doing it's well. I think there's a, you should do it a different way. You know, it, it would be natural that they will feel um, perhaps that I'm finding fault and so on. So, you know, I'm speaking these things, but it's a, it's a reality that we confront every day about, well, how do we respond when things are not going the way that we, you know, think they should go? If we see a way which we think will be better, what's the best way to communicate it? And so, you know, I'm not sure. I, um, you know, was discussing with a few devotees on, in this thread on Facebook, and, um, you know, we were sharing some ideas, which I think is a good thing. Um, but I was wary that it might be taken as criticism. And I was wondering, you know, what might be a better way? Perhaps, well, speaking in that example directly, perhaps it would be better to talk, um, you know, directly to someone who's in charge uh, at the temple that can actually do something about changing it. And, you know, very humbly, um, with understanding and appreciation, speaking to them and saying, um, I was thinking, would you consider doing this in a, in a different way? And sometimes maybe they won't um, see the benefits in the way I'm looking at it and they want to keep it that way. So in cases like that, I guess um, we have a choice. Do we try to um, push the point or do we just say, well, okay, that's how it is. And if I don't like it, maybe I should start my own temple. <laughs> I often um, sort of say that to my wife. It's like, well, you know, Maybe that's the way that they, they like to do it, and you know, our, they may not like our, our ideas so much, so maybe we need to start our own temple and we can do it in our own way. And um, I'm not really joking in that sense. I think that um, if we see things that often, or there's many things that we find that we'd rather do in a different way, and it's not much opportunity to change, maybe we should go and do some of our own initiatives because perhaps we can show a better example that may lead back to changes from where we've come. Um, or we might also find the challenges of trying to do that and you know, have a deeper appreciation of uh, what it takes to run a temple. So either way, I think um, taking initiative to try something is a, you know, a good opportunity. Um, yeah, so this is just an example. It's a small example and not a very heavy thing. But... Um, it just it shows how um, you know there's many different ways that we can approach things, and we need to consider: is this really constructive? Is it really helpful? Or am I just finding fault? Um, so in that thread, you know, as I was thinking this, then I, I wrote that: look, I'm, I'm not trying to criticise. It's not my intention. Hopefully, um, you know, the ideas that I've suggested, you know, might be considered and things like that. Um, yeah, so that was just a thought and you know experience of mine where um, there was a conflict or, or not a conflict but some dissatisfaction with the way that things were doing and we were looking at how we can offer a solution that might make things um, better. And then <clears throat> the thought process I was going through about how we might be able to present that in a way which is not threatening to people and um, discouraging but which provides energy and provides um, encouragement to devotees. So this was just a little, little discussion here um, about constructive criticism. So first of all, the trouble with ISKCON, that you know, we should be careful about l labeling and lumping everybody together, but rather we should look at individual cases and speak specifically about those. Um, you know, look at different devotees that are doing things and appreciate the ones that are doing um, things the way that we would like. And we can always find devotees like that. And if we do notice that there are some things which um, that could be improved, we can, you know, m make our observation and um, share it. But we should try to do it in a way which um, is inspiring and which will um, you know, lead to action. Because I found that this uh, ruffling the feathers technique, although it can um, generate public support, often it will attract people who have, um, you know, it will inspire people. It may often inspire people who have that similar kind of fault-finding mentality, rather than those that are, have that inspiration and that positive energy to do things and improve. Um, so they're just, they're just my thoughts about it. So I encourage you to please, um, if you notice things that are not right, don't just stand back and do nothing. It's really important that we uh, discuss and try to improve things. 
but see if you can do it in such a way that inspires others to um, to take action and make a difference. Lead by example yourself. And in this way, we can have a positive energy which will lead to improvement rather than uh, a negative energy which can hold us back. So, yeah, we'll just um, leave it like that. You know, we want everyone to be as Krishna conscious as possible and we want our movement to um, be inspiring overall, uh, systematically and individually. So do what you can to make this movement a um, progressive and positive um, movement. And then when people talk about ISKCON, they can talk about uh, all the great things that are happening and go out and do something to please Srila Prabhupada. So this is Krishna Das from Successful Vaishnavas and the Empower and Preach Network. Signing out, Hare Krishna, make your life successful.